Volar Inge Osteotomy plus Ulnar Shortening Osteotomy for Extra-Articular Dorsal Malunion of the Distal Radius Malunion after distal radius fractures can be extra-articular, intra-articular or both. Extra-articular malunions are more common especially in the dorsal direction. These malunions often present as radiographic deformity with loss of radial length, inclination, reversed volar tilt and radial translation of the distal segment. These patients often tend to be asymptomatic, especially if they are older and less demanding. On the contrary, younger patients with more demands might find it more disabling and might require surgical treatment to address the disability. The objectives of this educational program is to understand indications and contraindications of doing osteotomies in distal radius malunions, describe techniques to do osteotomy corrections in such settings. We will show you a surgical technique video of a volar inch type distal radius osteotomy plus shortening osteotomy of the ulna in an indicated patient. We will also describe results of our technique in our series over a period of five years and also look at briefly the literature that is available on the topic. The main indication for doing an osteotomy correction for distal radius malunion include pain which is most commonly ulnar sided and sometimes from the radiocarpal joint also. Other indications include loss of motion at the radiocarpal joint and at the DRUJ, carpal instability which is often adaptive and most commonly deformity which leads to poor function and dissatisfaction. Contraindications which are absolute include complex regional pain syndrome and radiocarpal arthritis. Severe osteopenia and profound stiffness are also relative contraindications. There are different techniques to perform osteotomy corrections in distal radius malunions. Conventionally, a dorsal open wedge osteotomy is done using a dorsal approach and filling the gap with shaped corticocancellous grafts. This approach provides good results but the fixation is less robust and you can also face more soft tissue problems because of the dorsal tendons. With the advent of volar locking plates, the dorsal open wedge osteotomy can be performed from the volar side using these strong fixation constructs. The volar locking plate provides excellent fixation and can hold the osteotomy open for a longer time without fearing loss of reduction or collapse. This also allows the technique to be used without the need for bone grafting in select situations. The plate being on the volar side is also associated with less soft tissue problems. There are two types of volar plate assisted osteotomies. One is an inch type of osteotomy where you inch the dorsal cortex open maintaining good volar contact and fixing with a volar locking plate. The other technique is to do a distraction type osteotomy where you distract the osteotomy so that you gain more radial length and inclination. The technique always needs bone grafting and it has been reported to associated with higher non-union rates. So our preference is to do an inch type of osteotomy especially in slightly older patients and combine it with an ulnar shortening osteotomy if corrections in ulnar variance is required further. The patient shown in the surgical technique video is a 52 year old female who is a software professional who sustained a distal radius fracture on the left side which was treated with plaster cast. She presented to us 8 months after the injury with complaints of ulnar sided wrist pain, reduced motion and weakness in grip. These are a radiographic parameters and she also had an adaptive type of carpal instability. Preoperative range of motion assessment showed deficiencies in flexion and supination. We used a volar FCR approach between the radial neurovascular bundle and the FCR tendon. The brachioradialis tendon is tenotomized and a Z-plasty is done. The osteotomy is then performed at a pre-planned level parallel to the articular surface and also making sure the osteotomy will end up proximal to the distal segment of the plate. Once the osteotomy is done, the volar locking plate is fixed to the distal segment 
and the anatomical design of the plate is made use of to achieve correction in both sagittal and coronal plane. Once the deformity is corrected, fixation is completed by using multiple cortical and locking edge screws. If further correction in ulnar variance is required, an ulnar shortening osteotomy is performed followed by fixation with either a 3.5 or 2.7 mm plates. The arm is positioned on an arm table with the tourniquet inflated and a formal timeout is performed. A curved incision crossing the palmar wrist crease is made over the FCR tendon and is deepened down to subcutaneous tissues and the fascia. The FCR tendon sheath is then incised and the plane between the FCR tendon and the neurovascular bundle on the radial side is entered. This plane is further developed to enter the space of Parona. A self-retaining retractor is placed proximally to retract the FCR and the FPL muscles towards the ulnar side. Dissection then proceeds onto the lateral side to identify and mobilize the brachioradialis tendon. A Z-plasty of the brachioradialis tendon is performed so as to facilitate lengthening of the radius. The pronator quadratus muscle is then gently elevated from the volar radial cortex by using a reverse L-shaped incision. The muscle is gently elevated in a superiosteal fashion from the radial towards the ulnar aspect. This exposes the entire volar radial cortex. The line marked shows the previous malunion and the 2 mm K wire is then inserted distally along the malunited radial articular surface. The plate is positioned provisionally so as to identify the intended site of the osteotomy. The osteotomy is made with a fine saw parallel to the articular surface the location of the osteotomy is chosen in such a manner that distal fixation through the plate is not compromised. A 2.4 mm volar distal radius locking plate is then positioned over the distal segment and secured to the distal segment using multiple locking edge screws. As you can see, the anatomical nature of the volar locking plate makes it sit proud and it does not sit on the OLR aspect of the distal radial shaft. Once three to four locking edge screws are placed into the distal segment, the anatomical nature of the plate can be used to correct deformity in both the sagittal and the coronal planes. As you can see by the position of the K-wire and the fluoroscopic images, you can see an appreciable improvement in radial length and correction of dorsal tilt. Once this is confirmed, further fixation to the proximal segment is completed. More distal fixation is added to improve construct stability and improve post-operative mobilization.
The void created dorsally by the osteotomy can be addressed in a lot of different ways. Our preference is to use autogenous cancerless bone grafts harvested from the proximal ulna. There are reports of using no bone grafts and also synthetic bone substitutes and those options remain very viable. Once the defect is packed, the KY retractor is then removed. The pronator quadratus muscle is then repaired in an anatomical fashion. Proper repair of the quadratus muscle is important to prevent any impingement of the plate onto the flexor tendons. The next step is to repair the Z-plasty of the brachioradialis tendon. Once this is completed, the soft tissues are then closed in layered fashion. As per our preoperative plan, in this patient we carried out an ulnar shortening osteotomy. An ulnar based incision is placed which is then taken through subcutaneous tissue onto bone. The volar cortex of the ulna is then exposed in a subperiosteal fashion. Retractors are placed and the site for the osteotomy is then marked making sure there is adequate room for fixation in the distal segment. As per our evaluation, our plan was to resect a 3 mm sleeve of bone from the ulna shaft. A 3.5 mm dynamic compression plate is then positioned on the osteotomized ulna and secured provisionally by using a 3.5 mm cortex screw in the distal segment. We then placed a 3.5 mm cortical screw proximal to the proximal most end of the plate to help us in reducing the osteotomy by using a push-pull technique. A verbugge clamp was used to close down the osteotomy and as you can see in the fluoroscopic images a much better ulnar variance after ulnar shortening osteotomy compared to before that. The osteotomy is then compressed further and then reduced by using another 3.5 mm cortical screw placed into the proximal segment. As you can see, the osteotomy is now well compressed and reduced. Further fixation is completed by placing multiple cortical screws into the distal as well as proximal segments. The procedure is now almost complete and as you can see on the fluoroscopic images, we have achieved a good correction in radial length, dorsal tilt, radial inclination and ulnar variance after combining the volar inch osteotomy on the distal radius and ulnar shortening osteotomy. Postoperative x-rays shows excellent correction of all radiographic parameters.
and follow-up x-rays at 28 months shows adequate healing and maintenance of correction. Follow-up range of motion assessment also showed improvements in flexion and supination. Another 40-year-old female from our series, she presented to us 7 months after injury with complaints of ulnar sided wrist pain and restricted flexion. She underwent correction using a similar technique and these are her post-operative and follow-up x-rays showing excellent outcome. She also had significant improvements in wrist range of motion. We operated upon 19 patients using this technique and 16 of them were followed up for more than 2 years. We used a volar hinge osteotomy alone in 9 patients and 10 patients required an ulnar shortening osteotomy as well. All patients underwent bone grafting from the proximal ulna. We achieved union in all patients and no difference in outcome or complications was seen. There were significant improvements in joint motion except extension and also in grip strength and dash course. All radiographic parameters also showed improvement within normal acceptable limits. When we looked at published results on the topic, we found two interesting papers. The one on the left looked at the technique of volar hinge osteotomy as in our series with or without the use of bone graft. The authors could not find out any difference in union or functional outcome. All patients in both groups showed excellent improvement in patient reported outcome measures. The paper on the right looked at whether volar or dorsal osteotomy is better for these corrections. The authors found out that after volar osteotomy, patients got better with regards to range of motion, patient reported outcome scores and also add less complications. However, the radiographic restoration was similar in both groups. Thank you.